Welcome to the course, Culturally Responsive Built Environments. Today, we will be talking about timber as a vernacular building material. So, uh, following upon our discussion on stone as a vernacular building material, I have introduced you to one of the important work of Brunskill's work on Illustrated Handbook of Vernacular Architecture, which he discussed about different material techniques as well as the walling elements, the roofing elements and uh, how to study vernacular architecture, how to document a building. So all these and especially in the focus of uh, the English heritage which he talked about. So uh, with this understanding and my personal living experiences in the Great Britain and as well as my living experiences in Sweden and part of my various visits to Finland, Switzerland and many other parts of European countries. So I try to bring a kind of uh, small summary of the timber constructions, especially how they carry particular traditions and how it is a traditional building reserves. So on, if you cl uh, classify the timber constructions, mainly you will find kind of three sets of constructions. One is a horizontal log type construction. So which is uh, the second one, we see the post and plank construction and the third one, the timber frame constructions. So if you see on the uh, right hand side, this is actually a photograph when I visited Levy. Uh, in fact, this is a small cottage house where we stayed. And um, this whole house is built, of, uh, built with the wooden logs, so the whole the tree trunks, because being a cold climate about, we are talking about a temperature of minus 30 to minus 40 in the harsh winters. So obviously timber, uh, it's uh, one of the best materials, in, especially in the cold climates. Uh, in winter, it makes you uh, warm and in summer, it makes you cool. So you can see that all these horizontal, the locks have been laid in a horizontal and then they have been interlocked at the junctions and that is how the whole house is made. Timber being an abundant resource in the Scandinavian countries, so obviously the way they grow, the, the way they protect their forests is completely you know, unmatchable with the kind of Indian context. So that is how uh, these particular countries, uh, even though uh, timber, uh, I mean of course the afforestation and deforestation is quite manageable and they do have a control of these resources, especially the forest stewardship councils in UK and which have a supply chain management processes as well. So uh, I will also introduce to some other uh, places where I was in uh, Jakapano in Poland and you can see all the whole setting is the whole village setting and the whole town setting is completely built with the timber uh, frames and here you can see, you see the post and the shingles on to the facade and the historic churches and the whole context itself it's matched with the kind of landscape setting and one of the important aspect is in some part of the geographies like for example in Essex where the termite aspect is also a crucial and obviously certain specifics of timber grades are used there. And this is again uh, in back in England, uh, this is actually the Shakespeare's house, his dwelling where he lived. And uh, what you see is a kind of post and plank construction techniques. So here you can see these are the vertical posts and you have these planks and they're huge and that adds to the English help. And so, uh, this is in Stratford upon Avon. So similarly, in the heart of London, you see if you go to the Oxford Street, and uh, that's where you see the Liberty Mart, where uh, the whole uh, building is of this uh, timber constructions, and uh, it is how they have renovated it, and how still it is have they've requalified these old houses for the new uses. And uh, this is a, one of the best examples. So uh, when we talk about these. Uh, timber houses, one of the important constructions which we need to discuss 
here is a crack frame buildings especially they are very popular in Leicester Square. I am giving you a small document link here so you can actually download this and this will be very useful especially it deals with the whole uh, crack frame buildings especially in the Leicester Shire. So basically in this crack frame this is a kind of A shaped uh, frames assembled on the ground basically they are assembled here and then they lifted like this like this and then they are tied up with these tie beams the collar beams and that is how you know they set up these kind of they call the uh, barge boards and as well as the wall plates so this whole skeleton is uh, is uh, much grandeur in nature and they're all basically laid on the ground and they lift it and they fix it to the uh, ground here right so one basic thing you have to see the a frames were assembled on the ground then read one by one into your vertical position so the ridge purlins the side purlins and wall plates could be dropped into their sockets and tie frames together so basically the time so basically the one you raise it and the tie actually binds together so there's a little tension created on it and basically the load actually distributes from these inclined members so how they join the detail of a crack construction so what they do is normally in the traditional uh, methods so they take a huge bark of a tree and sometimes cut into the half and exactly reverse it so basically it actually overlaps in a different direction and sometimes it matches and sometimes they have to cut uh, bring another pieces into it so that is how a true a trial and error process and what you can see here is um, a kind of lap joint and uh, so how it fixes on to the top so here you can see that uh, once they are laid and then bring up and at the same time this is how and the dis and this, partic this particular space which they referred as a kind of base so it, this is in between uh, these two posts and then that's referred as a bay and in fact uh, what you see in the in this diagram is uh, with two closed and open truss so you can see here there's a two closed and the third one is an open truss and similarly if you see the bottom right on here you can see how the corner and how the crack blade and the wall post rising from a timber still sill and stone plinth so basically you have the uh, stone plinth which is leveled and then again you have a corner like this you it sits on to the uh, uh, the lap joint and then the post comes and then from it again the crux starts moving on to the other direction so in the box type constructions what you see here is um, uh, the box type uh, box frames here you can see the kind of two base right and in length and uh, wall plates are connected in tie beams and you have these cross bracings which actually holds these kind of frames which is very common this particular uh, technique you can even find in Mediterranean countries I was in Cyprus and uh, even there I could able to find some of these constructions and how the intermediate things are filled with a kind of insulation materials so here you can see uh, how a corner rising you know the similar technique what you see here and what you see here and then how this is supported on either sides and then how it frames a frame then we come to what are the alternative methods of you know because each uh, it's just not a box we are building for a dwelling but it's so each uh, place has its own character based on its resources available and based on its historical uh, uh, futures or because it also adds on to the heritage of it so one of the construction which I would like to bring to you is the Vattel and Daub infill method so uh, in fact here you can see that you have the vertical studs and the horizontal rails so you can see there is a um, vertical studs here so how it fixes in the top and how it fixes in the bottom and then that gives a kind of framing and then these uh, vattles uh, have go like this one over the another so what you can see here is like this inside to outside outside to inside and that's actually again you fill with a kind of daub so this is a, one of the technique and uh, this is very
frequently you can observe in uh, basically in Hereford and Shropshire and many local variations in the way they view, in the way the size of the panels they are using. So another one, uh, this is a, a very quite common technique in especially with the tiles as the handmade tiles. So you can see that the same frames you have a small battens going on the horizontal directions and these handmade, so what you see here is the overlapping of the handmade tiles. So basically the, the tiles are hung on laths or a small battens which are going so that to give a triple lap you can see here one, two and three. So there is a triple lap each tile covering two others. So basically every tile is covering two other tiles where members of the heavy frame uh, were a far apart intermediate studs or uh, needed to help carry the lats. So basically they have a particular distances and then especially near the window you can see the details of it and what you can see is the reality of how even the walling material is completely cladded with tiles. Now coming to well, we just discussed about the uh, handmade cladding, but now if you go for the mechanical cladding or in other words we also refer to like a mathematical, mathematical cladding, tile cladding. So here one important aspect is in fact there are many companies, I am just giving a website of one of the company which actually do uh, the math mathematical tiles. In fact um, uh, these could be done in a kind of desired formats as well as for example if you take the corners so how a tile could be made in a desired format and uh, it also gives a kind of brick like face structure uh, it gives a kind of brick like face skin and uh, these tiles were normally hung or nailed to laths spanning between the frames and studs so narrow tiles are used at the closures because at the edge and uh, similarly you have uh, timber covered strips were used to conceal joints. So here you can see you have uh, the vertical member so where if you want to cover the joints because on one side you are keeping the tile, 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 tile and then you get a very abrupt so then they cover with a kind of timber uh, cover uh, strips so or any other material. So that is one of the uh, technique uh, in the cladding and whereas uh, the weatherboard cladding is also used. In fact, in these weatherboard uh, techniques, uh, the similar kind of cladding what you use is uh, kind of uh, any uh, advanced materials because these things are also quite common from 17th to 18th centuries also. And but nowadays, if you look at it in the uh, modern construction, they are using some kind of polyprylene sheets or anything for these cladding. And here again, you have these battens and they are basically of a single lap, you can see here a single lap and uh, just covered one below like this, like this sorry and this is again a butt joint, there is a butt joint and a lap joint and whereas here there are again a parallel faced, it is a little lap over here and uh, what you see here is a kind of as a butt with beaded edge so basically a little beading over there and again here lapped boards so what they do is so the section is something like this which is quite common this is quite common and so how this recession over it and then how it again uh, so these are all for good aesthetic purposes. So this is one what you can see here is a kind of uh, using the weather boards as a cladding and which could be also the backup to it is a kind of insulation material which we fill into it. So rather than a brick wall uh, on the facade what we use is we use a weatherboard cladding. And this is another plaster or pargeting as cladding. So this is uh, quite famous uh, especially in the Suffolk area uh, which you see quite often. So what they do is um, they have uh, these lats were made very closely right space to the studs basically maybe a f uh, this much uh, maybe a f about 5 centimeter or something 50 mm I can say. So and then they keep uh, the lats or the battens onto it 
and then they are also closely spaced to the studs and any necessary intermediate members because if it is continuous then they might may make an intermediate vertical members also if needed and frame plaster in two coats was then applied to the outside so it might be a stucco it might be a lime plaster or a particular uh, compositions which they can use at least two coats they used for the outside and there would be a separate lath and plaster interior lining the so basically what you see is these plasters and here you see here again this whole set what you can see is a kind of decorative element and it is also uh, referred as a kind of freehand pargetting so here uh, you need to have certain kind of picture of what kind of imagination you are going to create onto the facade of it and at the same time it should not uh, create a very high bumps or lows so it has to be a little uh, carefully done especially in this because especially the, the details which you have to see is the kind of edges how they plaster it at the same time uh, one has to look at it how the operational aspect of these windows and there are different patterns one can look at the zigzag patterns of it and there is a cable moulded or combed pattern of it and there is uh, a fan combed uh, pattern like you have the fan combed pattern and you have uh, the moulded pargeting uh, debased medieval pattern so which, which is of a kind of medieval times as well as uh, you have uh, the moulded panel pargeting so like that a variety of some of the motif uh, it could be a Corinthians or any other uh, natural elements you can bring into it. So it brings a kind of aesthetical. That is where uh, this particular technique is very relevant, especially when we are dealing with the culturally responsive built environments. And when you are dealing with these kind of old buildings, especially for any kind of renovations or if you are dominating with any kind of new um, intrusions in the context of these buildings, obviously certain care has to be taken from the urban design perspective as well. And I think uh, there are many more techniques but I would like to just uh, for this lecture I would like to brief about a kind of brick nogging technique. Uh, this is uh, one of the last I am going to discuss uh, here and here what uh, the same thing you have the frame here and in between sometimes uh, even in the crack tr trusses as well you can make it as a kind of different compartments and you knock the brick and the different ways how one can infill these particular panels. So one of some of the techniques you can see is um, brick on edge was used with lighter timber sections and as well as um, here if you see the kind of compartments they can do here is um, date picked out in the colored bricks so basically so they also worked out like I can show you a good example here the um, uh, one of the I got this a very beautiful photograph from Andrea could be in a flicker so one can see that so these compartments have uh, been or the structural uh, members and then you can see how the different proportions of the bricks are aligned in a different uh, fashion and you can do um, I mean extensive decoration with it with a simple material brick. So what we learn in the bonding techniques in, our, in the beginning of our architecture or the building construction classes is basically we know about the English bond, a Flemish bond, you have the English bond with uh, one um, header, one footer and you have the Flemish bond with uh, alternative header and footer. So in that way we did learn about this but you know how this timber could be a kind of uh, supportive material along with the brick walling systems you know so in that way it could be aesthetically uh, experimented and what you can see here is a kind of timber and you see the lintel uh, up here and uh, even in between you can see the filling material the nogging the bridge has the bricks have been knocked in and in various fashions on one side you have so this is also creating a kind of it's not continuous but you see they're breaking a kind of but whereas you see here it's a inclined but then uh, it's in a continuous uh, pattern so with this what we understood is just with the a timber especially in the countries like England or in uh, Sweden or in Finland or any other European countries 
uh, even in Canada, countries like Canada or even America, especially timber is one of the uh, biggest reserves for building activities. Not only now, historically it has been used as a basic building material. So one of the uh, demerits in the present context is especially with the fire. So how we can protect these timber buildings, to, uh, especially in the event of uh, fire, because uh, during the fire, the timber is much more prone and that is where the building codes, that is where the building codes will help us to how we can actually plan the building and how we can orient it, how we can compartmentalize the buildings and at the same time how we can provide insulation materials and how we can provide the fire, um, uh, you know, what kind of fire stoppage we can do, you know. So all these things, uh, these are some advancements and in the next class uh, what I will also deal with it is now as a timber as a vernacular building resource which we discussed. But then with various examples, uh, mostly we discussed in the English uh, side of it and we also did discuss about various techniques like cladding, wattle and dog cladding and uh, the crack construction which is more important uh, aspect in the timber buildings. And we also did discuss about the clay tile cladding and we also discussed about the mathematical tile cladding and the, which is also referred as the mechanical tile cladding and we also discussed about the weatherboard cladding. So in this way we did discuss and the next class uh, we will also look into how the advanced systems also work, a, a small brief about that we will also discuss about that. Thank you very much.